All right, class, so here we are once again with our discussion on the history of philosophy. So where we are in this discussion is we're going to be with Immanuel Kant, right? Now, we've got a lot uh, that we need to cover in Kant, and the reason being is simply because you remember how we talked at the onset, onset that in a lot of ways philosophy could be divided between the Socratics, right, and the pre-Socratics, or not Socratics, but the pre-Socratics, and then everything after Socrates, right? Now, many have done this even in regards to uh, Kant, saying that there's pre-Kantian philosophy and then everything after Kant. And I think that in some ways, this really could be a, a, a valid argument, that re this, this really could be possible. Um, that, come on now, don't do that to me. Let's see if we can get this going. There we go. All right, so they would say that you've got Kant, then you've got everything prior to Kant, then you've got everything after Kant. Now, what that simply means to say is, but they think you're like Kant. You have someone that tries to, and this is going to sound like Hegel, um, you know, this he he Hegelian, uh, a doctrine of of uh, synthesis of the the uh, the two competing forms of thought, right? Like uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? Um, but in Kant, we really do have something that that is similar to that in the sense that he wants to try to bridge this gulf between the rationalist idea of philosophy and the empiricist's idea of philosophy right now specifically in regards to epistemology now that is how, how do we know right or can what how do we even act go, go about the act of knowing right now we've talked about before how classical philosophy um up until the modern period had roughly started with metaphysics right like uh, there's external reality and then how do we know what we know about external reality right so it was it so epistemology was roughly assumed in some sense, in some sense. Now, after that period, right, starting with Descartes, we came to the, to the conclusion that because of Descartes, right, it's philosophy starts to try and begin with epistemology, right? And the difficulty in beginning with epistemology is how do you ever really ever get out of your head, right? If, if you're trying to reason to, the fact that there's an external world, um, it just seems like that if you start there, you're just going to go off the rails. You can't get to the external world simply by reason um, because you have to have experience of the external world, right? Hence empiricism. You have to have experience of the external world um, before you can reason to it, right? And so Kant sees all of this, right? So let's go ahead and start with this, this, uh, this slide here. Now, Kant thought of his own system of thought, something like a Copernican revolution, right? So you remember uh, Copernicus <clears throat> defies the, the current scientific notion of his day that this, that everything is, is uh, geocentric, right? That everything revolves around the earth, right? Now, when, when he find, he proposes his, his idea, his theory that everything is, uh, that, that it's actually a heliocentric, right, system, that is, we all revolve around the sun, that just, that radically changes everything, right? <clears throat> it's not that it's just simply a different type of scientific theory, and there are a couple of different consequences. It's that if that's true, that if heliocentrism is true, that everything revolves around the sun, then that changes everything, right? That uh, up until what, about what we've thought about planetary motion, about what we've thought about our place in the universe, all these sorts of things, right, supposedly follow from the fact that heliocentrism is, heliocentrism is true and not geocentrism. Now, Kant looks at his philosophical school, right? Not philosophical school, but his, his philosophical theories, right? His philosophical uh, contributions as a Copernican, a Copernican revolution in the area of philosophy, that everything is going to change by this. Because up until that point, the assumption was that, remember, we could get to an external world somehow via the mind um, and our what we thought about the external world 
was a reflection of the external world in some shape, form, or fashion, right? That we, that our mind, that our perceptions somehow did reflect the external world as it was in some sense. Now, this is going to be massive because Kant is coming in and he's saying, and again, I'm hoping you're I'm just again trusting that you're following uh, closely within your texts or any of the recommended texts here, um, because this is supplementing that. Now, when Kant comes in, right, he's saying that, wait a minute, what if it's not that the external world is responsible for the impressions and the perceptions and, and our the way we experience all of these things in inner emotional mind, Kant's system is roughly this. He's like, what if it's really our mind that shapes the external world? What if it's our mind that is the constructor of the external world? Now, Kant's not saying something like, uh, that your mind completely, like you just create reality. He's, he's not saying that. He, he's trying to, and I'm trying to see how I want to put this in, in order of some sense. So let's, let me just stick with this, and hopefully this will be a bit easier before we get to the paper once again, because, again, the paper that I'm going to look at is going to be a summary here. Um, yeah, so let's do it that way. So... First off, everything we've talked about this thus far is going to be in his work called The Critique of Pure Reason. It's back here somewhere, right? Again, you can find it pretty quickly or easily, pretty cheaply too as well. Hackett Publishing, right? On Amazon and whatnot. But this work is going to be called The Critique of Pure Reason. And, and just like the title goes, he wants to say there's something wrong with um, just trying to use pure reason, right, in, in regards to our, our ability to gain knowledge. So he, he credits David Hume. Remember, we're seeing all this reaction to th particular thoughts, to, to previous schools of thought, previous ideas. And so he, he credits David Hume with saying that it's Hume who has, and this is how he famously says that he's awakened, Hume has awakened him from his dogmatic slumbers, right? That's the quote. That's what Kant says there, is that Hume has awakened him, awakened him from his dogmatic slumbers. Now, he thinks that Hume is right in, in, in the basic gist of how we get knowledge. So what I remember Hume called the relation of ideas, um, Kant is going to roughly call say that these are, are, are analytic truths, right? These are analytic judgments. They're just true by definition, right? But then he's also going to say that Hume is right in the sense that we come to knowledge about the external world via the external world, right? Meaning that we, we have to have experience in some sense of the external world. Now, of course, Hume's system led to radical skepticism, right? Because remember, his whole point was that if it's not true by definition, um, if it's not true by definition, if it's not a, 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 a truth that's just logically related, right? Like mathematics and so on and so forth. And it can't be experienced, directly experienced, not something that's drawn from experience, right? That goes beyond experience, like an inference, uh, induction, remember, the whole point of induction. Then it just can't, it, it's just useless, and there's just no sense in talking about it in any meaningful sort of way, right? That was just, that was Hume's fork, right? Now, Hume, now, uh, now Kant is going to agree with that in some sense, but the point, but, but Kant's problem is that he... He doesn't like the skepticism of where Hume's project goes. Kant is entranced with and, 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 and loves this, this, this scientific advancement that we have gotten um, at this point in, 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 in history, right? The, the findings of Newton, all of the scientific data that we've accumulated at that point. Um, he really wants to hold on to the truth of that, the objectivity of that, the um, the fact that that's true for all people, right, at all places at all times. But he realizes that if, if Hume is right, then we lose all of that, right? Science um, being the search for causes is flushed down the toilet, right? We've, we've lost all of that if Hume is correct. And so he, or, uh, Kant wants to rescue um, science, um, real knowledge. He wants to rescue it from that. But, it, but the problem, again, is he thinks Hume is essentially correct in his evaluation of how we come to knowledge. So what is he supposed to do here, right? What is Kant supposed to do? Well, this is where he tries to bring 
um, this synthesis of some sort and, and tries to uh, rescue this this philosophy, right? Rescue knowledge or our, our ability to know scientific truths and whatnot. So we're going to look at some of that and we're going to maybe look at a, a couple of critiques or counters to uh, this system. So again, as we've noted, um, if, if Khan is right, he, he well, not if he's right, he just dubs this himself, that his philosophy is the Copernican revolution of philosophy. Right? He's going to try to bring the synthesis. Um, now, as we've already slightly mentioned here, or, or briefly mentioned, that his epistemology is what we're going to primarily concentrate upon, because again, starting roughly with the modern period, right, at Descartes, epistemology is the concern, right? It seems that most modern philosophers um, and even contemporary philosophers having taken the lead of modern philosophy are going to roughly begin with epistemology, right? Now, again, he's going to, his epistemology has these analytic truths, right? And then these synthetic truths, right? And analytic is simply, again, it's true by definition. It's it's true prior to experience, right? Again, these would be your logical relation of ideas and those types of things, right? And then he has what are called uh, synthetic truths. And again, I'm, not, I'm just going to briefly mention this here because I want to spend much more time on what Kahn is going to call the noumenon, the phenomena. Um, but then he has synthetic truths that are, that's what you gain by experience, right? And those are roughly similar to, uh, you know, Kant uh, or Hume's uh, matters of fact. Now, let me just read it off this way. When, when Kant talks about analytic judgments, um, again, these are like Hume's relation of ideas. He, these are judgments that are governed by the law of contradiction, right? So it's opposite. It's necessarily false, right? Um, and that's the way a philosopher like uh, uh, J.T. Bridges would put it that these types of judgments are uh, governed by the law of non-contradiction. Again, those are true before experience. Now, the synthetic judgments, um, these are uh, ones in which the predicate gives us new information about the subject and synthesizes the two terms. So I think the famous example is bachelors have a collection of etchings or drawings or whatever, right? You can't know that until you um, actually go out and experience something about the world, right? Of course, these are a priori, knowledge that can be attained independently of experience, and a posteriori, right, uh, which would be obtained by experience. Now, the controversial part is this synthetic a priori, right? So if synthetic knowledge, synthetic judgments and whatever come by experience, Kant proposed this, this synthetic a priori, this synthetic by experience, but knowledge that's true prior to experience. Well, how on earth do you make sense of that, right? And again, this is where I'm going to trust that you're doing the readings, um, either the or official text or recommended readings to, to help you uh, get clarification here. But Kant gives this as a way in which we gain knowledge. This is one of his contrib uh, controversial contributions here. And uh, really a lot of what the critique of pure reason is about. And what Kant is essentially saying that there are judgments that give us knowledge about the world. Uh, but, but don't require confirmation by experience. So something like the law of causality. You don't know that um, until the, uh, your, the experience of the law of causality. However, um, that's true prior to any experience of it in some sense. So, and again, this would, uh, one of his famous examples is something like seven plus you know, four equals, you know, whatever. That that's, that's true by experience um, but it's true prior to experience, right? Now, this is controversial. I remember, just, you know, in my graduate studies, going back and forth, back and forth, this whole thing about synthetic a priori truths, um, you know, with, with students arguing, but isn't, uh, you know, uh, isn't seven plus four, uh, seven plus four equals, you know, eight, nine, 10, eight, nine, 10, 11, seven plus four equals 11. Isn't it just another way to say 11 when you say seven plus four isn't the isn't the information contained within the uh the subject there seven plus four isn't the the, the information 11 just contained within seven plus four prior to the equal sign equals 11 right now again that's so controversial it's back and forth all, all kinds of stuff i remember going back and forth again with that in graduate school but there you go that's the, one of the controversial aspects or or and one of the big discussions in the critique of pure reason. 
Now, what I want to look at is this. What I really want to focus upon is this, this what Kant dubs the phenomenal and the noumenal realms, right? So if I'm looking right now out, and this is his, this is his, how do we, his theory of, of how we know reality, right? What is reality? How we know reality. Now, Kant's system is essentially going to say something like, imagine that you have on a pair of rose colored glasses, right? And so everything that you look at is obviously going to be, whatever you see is going to be filtered through the rose tinting of those glasses, right? So whenever you experience anything, you're going just to simply experience, experience that um, with the rose colored glasses. You can't, you, there's just no way to get around it. Again, let's just pretend like they're permanent, right? You can't get them off. Anything you experience is going to be that way. So if I'm looking at a tree outside of the window here, I don't see the tree as it is. I don't see the tree as it really exists in and of itself. I, I, I experience the tree through the rose colored glasses, right? Now, the tree in and of itself, reality in and of itself is what Kant is going to call the noumenal realm, right? That's the noumenal, that's the noumena, right? I don't really, I don't have access to the noumena at, in and of itself. Right. All I have access to is what Kant calls the phenomena. Right. The phenomenal realm. The, the realm after my, it's gone through my rose colored glasses. So Kant's big idea here is that. The mind is like the rose colored glasses. The mind is what gives shape to reality. So Kant even proposes these these 12 categories, time, space, relations, all of these sorts of things that the mind has these categories, these, 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 imagine these drawers, so to speak, that as the, as reality is coming into the mind, the mind is configuring reality according to those categories. So uh, John Frame gives an example like this. I'm not a massive fan of his type of philosophy, but I think he gives a fantastic example here of what Kant's talking about. He says, imagine that, Reality is jelly, right? There's no structure to it. It's completely loose. It's completely formless in some sense or whatever it may be. But your mind is the jelly jar. And so imagine you've got, you know, whatever, whatever you pour the jelly into the jelly jar and the jelly jar is what gives the structure to the jelly, right? The jelly just takes on whatever structure that the jelly jar is by itself, right? So, Reality, the noumenal, right? Once it comes through right, those are the, the glasses, right? The phenomena, once it, it's into the pheno ph phenomena, as you experience it, your mind has already structured it in a in a certain way. Like uh, again, certain categories like time, uh, such as uh, relation one to another type of thing, right? Uh, causality, all these sorts of things. Your mind has already structured reality. So really what you have access to is the phenomenal, right? Kant would argues that we just don't have access to the noumenal realm, right? The outside, the external as it is. We, that's just exactly what we don't have access to. So again, if I'm looking at the tree, I'm not experiencing the tree as it is. I'm experiencing the tree as it is perceived or as it is structured by the mind, right? How it stands in relations to things. Uh, to things, how it moved, you know, all these sorts of things. Those are, it's, my mind is what gives that its construction, how it is in and of itself. That's what Kant calls the noumenal and the phenomenal type of realm. Now, at this point, I want us to go, I want us to go ahead and look at the paper, right? That where we talked about David Hume, the problem of induction, how we know some of these sorts of things, because again, remember Kahn is writing in reaction to Hume and he wants to give an answer uh, to that, how he believes that he can make sense of this, right? So I'm going to pull that up now and I'm going to read through that again. Um, that's not what we wanted to do, right? And I'm going to read through that again um, and give some commentary as we do that. So, Perhaps objectivity in science. Remember, not just objectivity in science as in the discipline itself, but objectivity in, in the external world, right? But objectivity in science, say cause and effect, 
um, can be salvaged by Kant's solution. It's not the intention of this e essay to offer a full critique of, of, of Kant, but we're going to get some, some, something here from that, right? Now, Kant desperately tries to rescue the objective truths of science, especially the great success in Newtonian physics blossoming, blossoming within his own time, by providing a middle path, so to speak, that will provide room for the objectivity of science and supposedly to faith, but that's another matter. Because just briefly, Kant also wanted to try to rescue faith in some sense. Because remember, if we go back to Kant or uh, David Hume's critiques, faith, all sort of metaphysical truths, what we can know beyond experience are just, they're shattered, right? And Kant agrees with Hume that all of these arguments for existence, they just simply won't work, but he wants to somehow rescue this to, to be able to give faith room somehow, right? But don't worry about the faith aspect right now. Let's just concentrate on external reality and science and whatnot. On the side of the on the side of Locke and Hume, Kant agrees that all of knowledge comes by experience, but that it is not only by experience. Remember your your a priori types of truth. Really. The mind is not passive in the way that sense impressions are received. The mind acts on all of these sense impressions. Remember, because prior to all of this, remember the, the, the theories, the prevailing view was that the mind simply takes in whatever external reality is impressing upon it, right? And that you're, you're, the mind, the perception is, some, is somehow, uh, somehow a reflection of external reality. Remember, Kant's throwing all that out and he's saying, wait a minute, it's not as if the mind is simply passive that it's whatever you see from external reality is impressing itself upon the mind. Remember, Kant is saying that the mind is actually structuring reality to its form, right? Remember the jelly jar, it's structuring reality to its own form here. So the mind acts on all of these sense impressions uh, from an assumed external reality, right? This is what Kant would call the nominal realm, right? So in that there are categories, those 12 categories, within all human minds, that form one's ideas in a systematic and orderly fashion. So apparently this is supposed to salvage the objectivity of knowledge as these categories are universal and objective in their scope in that all minds share them. Now, this is also supposed to salvage the universal claims of empirical sciences and Newtonian physics. So again, Kant is simply saying that they're all objective or, or our knowledge and our, our, our ability to know things, even though we don't have access to the external world as it is, we all share these categories. And so my view of causality is the same as your view of causality. My view of time and space relations and all these sorts of things are, are the same as yours because we all share this way of structuring reality as it comes into our mind. Now, if you're a step ahead, you may see that there's, that's going to be a big problem, right? But anyway, this is supposed to salvage the objectivity of knowledge as these categories are universal, uh, they're objective in their scope, and that all of us share them, right? The ways in which one may know are by analytic judgments. Now, again, this is similar to uh, Hume's relation of ideas. Synthetic judgments, and these are similar to his matters of fact, are a priori and a posteriori types of knowledge. From this, Kant also goes on to propose that, with little opposition, there are prior analytic judgments, and yet very arguably, and this is what we've already mentioned, that there are a priori synthetic judgments in which something such as the law of causality would fit, or Kant's famous example of 7 plus 5 equals 12. At this point, some serious questions may be raised. Now, if we're flipping back over here to our slides, right, when we look at the phenomenon of noumenal, nominal. Um, we're going to start to look at what are the foundations of some of this, uh, of, 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 his, of his theory of knowledge, right? We're going to start to look at that here. Kant states that the nominal or the external world is out there, right? Remember, nominal, the nominal world, the nominal realm is Kant's term for the external world. And that's out there, right? That's external to you and I, right? External to human beings, right? Yet one can have no knowledge of anything in regard to it beyond our perception. So remember, 
I don't experience the tree as it is, right? I experience the tree, the tree through the rose tinted, you know, the, the rose colored glasses, right? I experience the tree after my mind, the, the, the jar has already structured the jelly into its own fashion, right? That's how I experience the tree. I don't experience the tree as it is. I experience uh, the tree through my uh, through my perceptions of that, right? How my mind has structured that, right? How my mind has structured reality. So, Kant states that the noumenal, the external world, is out there, yet uh, one can have no knowledge of anything in regard to it beyond our perception via the forms by which our mind forces upon the raw data, which is the phenomenal world. Again, this is because the mind, like an empty jelly jar, takes in the data and forms it to itself just as the jelly is formed to the structure of a jar, right? Now, this is where we start to look at some difficulty with that. However, it is quite difficult to believe that this very point is not a glaring contradiction to Kant's teaching that the forms, the categories are limited to our own minds simply because if the above is true, then cause and effect are not constructs of our own mind as the external world must be an exterior, must be in an exterior and causal relationship between the external things and the perceptions. The external world is putting off or causing us to perceive raw data. Remember, if our mind, one of the categories being causal relationships, right? Law of causality and whatnot. Well, then how is it that Kant knows that the external world is causing perceptions, right? That's exactly what you can't know. And that's just one, one difficulty that's been raised before. Now, moreover, if our own minds are what give the impressions of cause and effect, something that is supposedly not true of the nominal world, then how can Kant know that there are any external things that are causing representations? Moreover, if one's own mind is that which gives the impressions of cause and effect, something that is supposedly not true or cannot be known, rather, of the nominal external world, then how can Kant know that there are any external things that are causing representations at all? You see the bigger problem there. If Kant is saying that the, the tree in and of itself, I'm not experiencing the tree in and of itself, I'm just experiencing the perceptions of the tree as formed by my mind, right? Well, then the problem is, well, how do you know then, if I don't experience the, the tree in and of itself, then how do I know there is a tree in and of itself? See, that's a massive problem. This goes back to, um, we haven't done a lecture on this, but in our readings, George Barclay, remember? Barclay's whole idea of idealism being true, meaning that your perception of the tree just is the real tree, right? His example is the apple, right? So when you experience an apple, your perception of the apple, it's not as if the real apple is not there and all you have access to is the perception. Remember Barclay said that your perception just is the apple, right? This is idealism, right? The, the reality is not some material external thing, but just ideas. That just is reality, right? So this is crazy stuff, right? This is philosophy. Um, so anyway, the point being, how does Kant even know there's a nominal realm if all we have access to is the phenomenal, right? Now, perhaps, perhaps Kant's approach may, be, may work from another angle, uh, angle. I've got all kinds of typos in here, right? Let's just put this up pretty quickly now. Anyway, or did I? Right. <laughs> Kant teaches that these supposed universal truths are actual in the sense that they are the result of an a priori, or, or are the result of a priori truths again, which are supposed to account for these universal and objective truths, right? Simply put, Kant postulates that the individual has implanted his nod to the rationalists, forms, categories that we find our experiences poured into simultaneously as one contacts the world. And these results, in, and this results in our thinking in terms of cause, space, time, subject, relation, etc. Roughly, these are ins inescapable as we experience the nominal external world, the world as it is. And though Kant argues that all possess these a priori forms, notice that this world as it is, is untouchable by any individual or his senses. Kant argues that since we all must communicate using these a priori concepts, 
as if we did not possess them, then we could not interact at all. Perhaps this rescues true objectivity and true uh, objective causal knowledge. So Kant is essentially saying that, look, this gives a, and you note here too, uh, Van Thiel and a lot of the presuppositionalists have bought into this. This is why I think presuppositionalism goes wrong because presuppositionalism has bought into these critiques given by Kant, right? Hence this transcendental type language we hear all the time. Now, perhaps this rescues true objectivity and true objective causal knowledge. Uh, again, because Kant is just saying, like, look, if it, we know that we all have to be thinking in these, in these categories, otherwise we wouldn't be able to communicate, communicate at all. There'd be no exits, there'd be no transcendental, right? solution to this this has to be transcendental otherwise we have no grounding for how we know any of these types of things at all we have no grounding for our communication any of these the, uh the, these causal concepts any of these types of things right so this has to be true for all people which makes it objective Kant would say now this seems dubious at the outset as how would one know if one could or could not communicate with another if it is supposedly a given that there is no way by which to test the assertion, right? We remember constantly we can't get around it, so there's no way to test it. So well, wait a minute, then. Perhaps one could not, but perhaps one could. There would be no truly objective criteria to evaluate such an assertion on this view. But leave that and concede his point for sake of argument. At best, it would still seem to boil down to a pragmatic form of argument. At best, it would still seem to boil down to a pragmatic form of argument concluding that if it works, therefore it's true. But of course, because this or that may not work, or it may work, does not mean that it's true at all, as demonstrated above. For an additional argument to destroy such a pragmatic view, you see Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism. Again, remember, this just goes back to our theories of truth. Just because something uh, works doesn't mean it's true, right? Now, if something's true, then given enough time, it will work. But it, just because something works doesn't mean it's true, right? Like, again, lies, right? They're never discovered, those types of things. But of course, because this or that may work does not mean that it's true at all. It seems that Kant wants to have his cake and eat it too. Now, consider Kant's point that the distinction that judgments of perception merely regard only with what we sense or intuit while judgments of experience regard what we infer from our perceptions. We cannot dispute judgments of perception because they are wholly subjective. For instance, one cannot inform another that a rock did not seem gray to him, right? If it seems gray to you, it just seems gray to you. No one can argue with you about that, right? Now, we can dispute judgments of experience as they are meant to be objective. One can inform him the rock was not gray, if in fact it wasn't, right? You can't argue that it seemed gray to him, but you can inform him that it's not actually gray at all, right? For instance, if you can you know, verify that it was spray painted red or whatever, right? But now here's the problem, but just who, if one cannot get beyond our perceptions, but just who, if one cannot get beyond our perceptions, is to hold to the objective standard by which we must judge these perceptions, right? If neither one of us can get to the beyond our perception, then how do you know? Right? Which one is which? How can you say that the other is right or the other is wrong if we can't get beyond each of our perceptions of the thing? Right? Now, perhaps Kant would be happy to concede as much on his view. If this is the case, then it would seem that objective and universal truths, and as our concern, true and objective causal connections, are only as much in name only. There are no objective and universal truths regarding the world as is that can be known. On this understanding or account, it seems that one must simply pass on Kant's efforts to salvage truly objective knowledge of cause and effect without simply redefining what anyone actually means by the term objective. Now, this is another difficulty. And consider that Kant's understanding in regard to the real, the external world, or noumenal, involves the 12 categories used or imposed by all human minds. Remember, Kant is saying that these 12 categories that these, uh, that all of the external experiences poured into, right? He's saying that all humans share this, right? All humans have do have these categories, right? Yet on the, the limitations of perception, because of the limitation of perception, it's on view, right? Then how does one know if there really are other human minds? In fact, even conceding that there are other, other human minds, what grounding could Kant offer in the highly unlikely event as to why literally all people share 
those categories, right? So if everything's limited to perception, well, then how do you even know there are other humans, right? Again, you see, when, when, when we begin with epistemology and we try to work through this out, saying that there's this gulf between our perceptions and external reality, it just collapses into skepticism, at least I would argue, collapses into skepticism. Even here, again, solipsism, right? How do you know anybody else exists, right? Uh, where were we? As mentioned above, uh, this is because the because it works argument is because it's somewhat dubious, right? Again, it's going to say, well, this serves as the basis for all of our knowledge and we can't get around it. Well, that again, that just seems to be to say, well, it works. It has some explanation here, so we have to accept it. Well, that doesn't mean it's true, right? Now, finally, most importantly, Kant's entire system is massive implication. This might be the important, most important point or critique or difficulty. And finally, most importantly, Kant's entire system, his massive implication is that one cannot know reality as it is, right? Again, think back. If I'm not experiencing the tree in and of itself, right, the tree as it is, but I'm experiencing the tree as formed by uh, my mind, right, my perceptions as already formed by my mind that if I can't experience reality as it is, that might be self-defeating, right? So if we're flipping back over here, we're looking back at our, our slide, does the law of non-contradiction come into play? Or are, are we about to see Kant violate the law of non-contradiction in some sense, right? Because remember, if something violates the law of non-contradiction, it just doesn't, I'm sorry, your system crumbles, if that actually is the case, if it really does. So, Let's read this sentence again. And finally, and most importantly, Kant's entire system, his massive implication seems to basically boil down to this, that we cannot know reality as it is, right? Because of our limitations. But how is this not self-defeating? For instance, to ask Kant if one can know the baseball bat directly in front of him, right? Or in this case, I'm looking at a guitar, right? If I can't know that guitar as it is, this is right in front of me, now, Kant must answer, if he is to be consistent, that the individual that I cannot know the bat as it is in and of itself, but only my perception of the bat. But this is, of course, but this, of course, would have Kant claiming exactly what he claims that one cannot know. Namely, Kant would have to know that his system is the truth of reality as reality really is. In order to say that one could not know reality as it is, one would have to know reality as it is, right? One would have to know the metaphysical overarching objective truth of reality as it really is. The very foundation seems to be self-defeating. So I want you to try to think of that again, right? Pause this if you need to, go back, look at some of the writings and see if you draw out that, that, that Kant is saying, look, my entire theory is saying there's a noumenal world that we cannot actually know. All we can know is the perceptions of the noumenal world. Well, one, how do you even know there is a noumenal world if all you have access to is the, is the perceptions? Two, how do you know that any of us are even there if we don't have access to any of the things that are supposedly there, right? Like us, other minds, these, these categories that other people share, all this, all, so on and so forth. But then, in the most difficult fashion, right? If you're saying that, well, you know, reality as it is, the noumenal world, we can't have access to it. Well, how do you know that? You would have to know reality as it is in order to make the claim that we can't actually know reality as it is, right? Because remember, every affirmation presupposes a negation, right? So sometimes a philosopher like Norman Geisler, would, he has this little term called the nothing buttery fallacy. Um, and he's saying that Kant is essentially saying that reality is nothing but this. And the problem with that is saying that you have to have knowledge beyond what your claim is in order to have knowledge of the actual claim itself. So for instance, if I were to say that a football field goes only 100 yards, well, then I have to have a little bit of knowledge beyond the football field, right? Otherwise, I can't say that that's where it stops. It may go 105 yards, right? It may go 110 yards. But in order to say where it stops, I have to have a little knowledge beyond that, right? And so if I were to say that my knowledge can't actually get to reality, well, then how do you know that? 
because you're assuming that you're past the mark looking back and saying, yeah, that my knowledge can only go that far. Right. But that's exactly what you don't know. Right. So let me see if I can pull something up very quickly, because there's another um, there's another bit, uh, another way to word this that, that Geisler actually words. And he says it in such a way that I think is very lay friendly. Um, and I think it's in his book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Um, now, whether or not that's germane to what, whatever you're feeling at the moment is irrelevant. I'm, I'm just simply trying to point out a critique that he, he levels at Kant there in that book. Um, let me see if I can get that very quickly here in my uh, drive. I think I, I think I have it. Well, this is trying to get me to pull up the same thing. and I don't want to do that. <laughs> Maybe I can go ahead and just go back to drive here. Uh, let's get that. All right. Let's see. Pull this up. Uh, <laughs> you gotta be difficult, are ya? La, 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 la. I think I can get lucky and pull this up in my own search bar. Nope. And I don't know what that is on the screen, so there's a little comic, uh, a little comic relief for us at the moment. Let's see here. Pull up drive again. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're cooking with natural gas. Let's see if this pulls up. Let's go to PDFs. And drive. Let's see. I know this is taking a minute, but I really do think it will be good. Let's see. I think it's. Yeah, I know which folder it's in. This is apologetics course had it one time. All right. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Where is you? Where is you, baby? There we go. All right, again, sorry, I know it's taking a minute, but I, I do know that this will be a uh, good point here. Let's see. Let's pull this up. See if we can do this faster. Good night, man. I apologize. Just take me a minute here. My apologies. All right, finally. I'm sure some of you are probably like, wow, that's ridiculous. All right, so here's the point, right? Here's where we see this. This is from uh, guys learning Turks. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Now, let's just look at this real quick, real, uh, real quickly. Immanuel Kant's impact has been even more devastating to the Christian worldview than David Hume's. Now, you can say Christian worldview, but you can also just say in regards to our ability to know reality. For if Kant's philosophy is right, then there is no way to know anything about the real world, even empirically verifiable things. So I've, I've, I've skipped this other thing uh, above that. You've already gotten all that, what we've talked about thus far. Why? Because according to Kant, the structure of your senses and your mind forms all sense data. So you never really know the thing in and of itself. You only know the thing to you after your mind and senses form it, right? To get a handle on this for a second, look out the window, a tree, exact same example I was giving earlier, right? Kant is saying the tree you think you're looking at appears the way it does because your mind is forming the sense data you're getting from the tree. You really don't know the tree in and of itself. You only know the phenomena your mind categorizes about the tree. In short, you, and then they do, Oh gosh, you're, this is going to be stuck in your head forever now. In short, you can't know the real tree in and of itself, only the tree as it appears to you. 
Now, anytime you hear caught, that's going to be stuck in your head. I can tell you now, 10, 15 years later, I'm still thinking in terrible uh, Kant, Kant puns, right? <laughs> Why is it that the average person on the street doesn't doubt what he sees with his own eyes, but supposedly brilliant philosophers do? The more we study philosophy, the more we are convinced of, that, of, it, that, that, uh, convinced of this. If you want to make the obvious seem obscure, just let a philosopher get a hold of it. Nevertheless, we can't avoid studying philosophy because good philosophy must exist, right? Now, it, Kant's philosophy has convinced many people that there's an unbridgeable gulf between them and the real world, and there's no way that you can get any reliable knowledge about what the world is like, much less what God is like, right? Now, according to Kant, we are locked in complete agnosticism about the real world. Thankfully, there's a simple answer to all this, the law of non-contradiction, as guys on Turek Klein here. They say he violates this law, right? He contradicts his own premise by saying that no one can know the real world while he claims to know something about it, right? Namely, that the real world is unknowable, right? You see how this, if true, this, if this charge is true, that how it's violating the law of contradiction, right? In effect, Kant says the truth about the real world is that there are no truths about the real world. Since these self-defeating statements can stump even the sharpest mind, let's look at Kant's error another way. Kant is also making a logical fallacy, and this is what brought up my uh, recollection that he, that Geisler does something like this, uh, or charges that he does the nothing buttery fallacy. This is what brought this up. Kant uh, is also making, uh, making a fallacy called the nothing buttery fallacy. This is a fallacy because nothing but statements imply more than knowledge. Kant says he knows the data that gets to his brain is nothing but phenomena. But in order to know this, he would have to be able to see more than just the phenomena. In other words, in order to differentiate one thing from another thing, you have to be able to perceive where one ends and the other begins. For example, if you put a white piece of paper on a black desk, the only way you can tell where the paper ends is by seeing some of the desk that borders it. The contrast between the paper and the desk allows you to see the boundaries of the paper. Likewise, in order for Kant to differentiate the thing in the real world from that which his mind perceives, he would have to be able to see both. But this is exactly what he says can't be done. He says, the, he says only the phenomena of the mind can be known, not the noumena, right? Not the noumena, his term for the real world. If there's no way to distinguish between the phenomena and the noumena, then you can't see how they might differ. And if you can't see how they might differ, then it makes much more sense to assume that they are the same. In other words, that the idea in your mind accurately represents the thing in the real world. What we are saying is that you really do know the thing in and of itself. You really do know the tree that you're seeing because it is being impressed on your mind through your senses. In other words, Kant was wrong. Your mind doesn't mold the tree the tree molds your mind. Just think about a wax seal. It's not that the wax seal, it's not the wax seal that impresses, or it's not the wax that impresses the seal, it's the seal that impresses the wax. There's no gulf between your mind and the real world. In fact, your senses are your windows to the world, and senses, like windows, are that through which we look at the outside world. They are not that at which we're looking. So they're saying that, you know, just like the rose-colored glasses. You just see through glasses. You don't see the glasses. You see through the glasses, right? That's their point there. Now, <clears throat> you can go back and even look at that if, if you want to in, in depth. Um, or you may have said, well, that entire exercise took too long. I never want to say that again. All right, fair enough. <laughs> but the point is, is, is <clears throat> of what we're looking at here, again, what I wanted to really concentrate on was Kant's view of the nominal phenomenal, the external world. Um, and how he got about that via his epistemology, right? Uh, namely, that we we have access to what we supposedly know via our perceptions, not just experience. More radical than that, but that our experience is limited in that 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 the perceptions that we have are that's all we have access to, right? Um, and how that may be self defeating, right? There are some counters that. Um, some may want to try to, 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 to give in, in regard to how that doesn't necessarily is how it's not self-defeating. But in my own opinion, it's very difficult for me to see how Kant's epistemology uh, and, and therefore his foundation for his entire system is not self-defeating in some way. Um, it's just not coherent. It's not ultimately coherent, I would argue.
Now, Kant also go, uh, goes on to, uh, because of his epistemology, right, that you can't have any real knowledge about these, these cause and effect relationships outside of, the, outside of perception, that you can't make any sort of metaphysical type of judgment. So this, again, this rules out um, arguments for God's existence. Um, he doesn't say that they're false. He just says that you can't know if they're true either. Um, Kant calls these antimonies, right? Uh, meaning he thinks that you can prove God's non-existence rationally, and he thinks you can prove God's existence rationally, which, of course, he would just say cancels out, right? He's also very rough on miracles, right? Kant is very rough on the possibility of miracles. Um, again, I'm trusting that you're following along in, in the text, right? Either the, either the required or recommended readings there. Um, Kant does want to make room for faith, and, and one of the reasons he does this, and we're about to look at this, we're about to go into this, is his ethical system. Now we're going to spend a, uh, well, let me say it this way first. He, he says the, the morality, this sense, this moral law within, as he puts it, um, is, is his best, uh, I don't want to say argument, but his best reasoning that we have to postulate God in some sense. Otherwise, there's no explanation for this moral law within us. Now he does think you can get the moral law without God, sans God. Right, which is going to be kind of odd because he all he postulates that there's more law within us and the starry heavens above, as he puts it, really, really, really give him his best reasons as to think that there's a, a God. Um, now, I'm going to I want to show you uh, we're going to go into this lecture about Kant's ethical system. Now, if you've already had my ethics course, then this is going to be a review for you because it's his, his ethic. Now, if you haven't. Um, and you're not going to take it, awesome, because you can't talk about Immanuel Kant without his um, <clears throat> epistemology, but then also his ethical system. Why not his ethical system? Because his ethical system is still in play today. It's still one of the heavy hitters in philosophical in the philosophical world, um, specifically ethics, right? The, the subdiscipline of philosophy, uh, ethics. So we're going to look at that. Now, if you're about to go into the course of ethics, this is you're already going to get a head start. You're going to already get a big introduction all right, yeah, and, and to Kant's ethical theory here, ethical system, his deontological system. Uh, but we've got, again, I, I really debated whether or not I was going to put this in with this course, but we've just got to. I mean, you can't talk about Immanuel Kant without talking about his system of ethics, <clears throat> and namely because it's still in play. Others had system of eth systems of ethics, and you'll get some of those in our, our ethics course, but this is one of the heavy hitters, no matter whether they're theists, atheists, uh, agnostics, whatever, if you're a philosopher, this is one of the uh, uh, big boys, so to speak, that's still in competition in the realm of ethics. And so we've got to talk about that. So you're going to see this uh, see this lecture here. Uh, it's going to be a crossover type lecture between our ethics course and this one. Now, having said that, after that, well, there you go. We're going to see you're going to see that. Right. So let me just leave off right here. Now, having said that, we're going to go into roughshod, I mean roughshod, uh, a very messy <laughs> uh, collaboration of a bunch of different philosophers uh, in the contemporary and late modern period, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, all those kinds of guys. That's how we're going to end up and round out the course, and we're going to round it out with a discussion on postmodernism, right? Uh, as kind of a conglomeration of all these modern and contemporary philosophers. However, having said that, see you next time. Enjoy the ethics right here.